Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, I will be talking a little bit about the DHS2 API today um, and a little bit about the, the, the data model of DHS2, which can be, can be quite complex. So it may be review for some people, but I feel like it, it doesn't hurt to um, have a review on, on the data model, um, especially when you're thinking about it from the perspective of an application developer, which might be different than from the perspective of someone who's uh, implementing DHS2 or using DHS2 as well. So let me go ahead and uh, get into this presentation here. Um, there we go. So when we talk about DHS2, there's a lot of different pieces to that. Um, this is a, a, a description of kind of the model of what DHS2 is. Um, we have D the, the core, which has the API, the data model, and the server of DHS2. And then we have bundled applications that are uh, come out of the box with DHS2 war file. Um, beyond that, we have periphery applications, which are applications that are uh, built on the, uh, on the application platform or the Android app, uh, SDK, uh, but aren't developed by the core team of UIO. Uh, and beyond that, we have interoperability with other um, systems. Uh, so this is just a very high level overview of what uh, the DHS2 ecosystem looks like. But today we're going to be focusing just on the middle piece. So um, at least for this session, we'll be talking about the, the core uh, and particularly the API, the REST API that is exposed by DHS2 and how you can use that in your web applications and Android applications as well. Um, so there are two different major uh, sort of sections of the API or the data model in DHIS2, and those are metadata and data. Uh, there's some other things as well that uh, we won't get into as much today. Those are uh, things like analytics, um, file resources, stuff like that, that don't fit exactly into metadata or data. Um, but for now, we're gonna talk about what, what is metadata, what is data, and how do you uh, operate on those things through the REST API? Um, metadata is, uh, as, as I've sort of described here, tried to describe it in plain English, but uh, it's the configuration of a particular DHS2 system to determine how data is collected and how it's analyzed. Uh, so for instance, a, a, a DHS2 has a concept of org units, but there are no org units built into DHS2 that has to be defined by the, the server or the implementation uh, that is using DHS2 software. Um, so the configuration of which org units are defined, which data elements are defined, which indicators are defined in a particular system, uh, we refer to that as metadata. And there's a lot of that. We'll, we'll get into uh, a, a little bit of it, but um, there's, that could be a whole separate course on, on what uh, how, to, how to configure the metadata of a DHS2 instance. Um, today, we'll just talk about how to interact with the API to view and edit that information. Um, we also have data, which is the actual values that are collected in through the DHS2 system. So in traditional aggregate uh, health management information systems, you collect, for instance, a number every month. So the, you might collect the number 42 every month, um, or, or, or it might be a different number every, each month, but you're, every month somebody at a, at, a, at a clinic is entering the number 42. Um, that 42 is the data, but without the metadata, you don't know what that 42 means, right? So that could be a number of births, could be the number of deaths, it could be the number of doses of a vaccine given, uh, could be any number of things. So uh, data is just the value, and then it's associated with metadata to figure out what, what that actually means. Um, and so it associated with the metadata to figure out the what, the where, and the uh, when of this particular collection of information. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, actually, I'm going to skip to this one first. Uh, so just to explain, uh, explain a little bit what I just said. So you have a data value might be the number 42. Um, that is associated with a data element, a period, and an org unit. And therefore, we know that that number 42 might be the number of deaths in February 2020 for the, uh, I don't know, the region of uh, the, uh, I'm, in, I'm in France, so the region of Ile-de-France, the, 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 the main province of uh, France. So 
that with those four things together, the number as well as what, where, and when that number was collected for, um, you have information uh, enough to, to do some analysis on that. Uh, but the data value by itself, which is just the number 42, doesn't necessarily have that information. Um, there are a lot of other types of metadata as well. So we had meta, we had data element, we had org unit, we also had uh, period, which isn't on this list. Um, but there's a lot of other pieces of metadata to configure DHS2 and customize it in a lot of different ways. Um, these are uh, this is a set of some of them. It's not all of them, uh, but this lets you uh, kind of see the complexity of the the data that could be modeled in DHS2. Um, each one of these uh, has an API endpoint that lets you list out the num the all of the indicator group sets or all of the organization units or all of the category option combos for a particular DHS2 instance using the REST API. And we'll get into how to do that in, an, in a couple minutes. This is, again, all of this is metadata. So this is not data. There are no actual values in, in these um, the responses from these API endpoints. Um, so th there's a different way to interact with the API when you're talking about metadata versus when you're talking about data. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. There, most people are probably familiar with this, but there's a, a concept of org units and a, a hierarchy of org units in uh, DHS2. And that is, again, configured for each instance of DHS2. Um, you have typically the national level is the top level of your organization unit hierarchy. Um, and then below that, you might have a district. Then you might have a chiefdom or a county or a province. Um, and then you might have a facility level. So uh, in, at, at this, typically in, in most health management information systems, you have all the way from the national level through maybe a district or a chiefdom to a, a facility. And that facility is often a hospital or a clinic or a, uh, maybe a vaccine distribution site or those types of things. Um, and that, uh, th that is a hierarchy. So there are certain facilities belong to a chiefdom, which belongs to a district, which belongs to an, uh, a particular nation. Um, these also have associated um, geographic areas or, or um, uh, geometries. So the, the nation of Sierra Leone has borders and those borders are modeled in DHS2 as well. Uh, similarly, each district within Sierra Leone has a different border. Um, and then a facility, which is the lowest level here, is located at a specific point on a map. Um, and so you can also use the API to interact with the, the locations of these things uh, in an interesting way. We won't get into too much of that today. Um, Jose will talk a little bit more about some of the tracker um, specific things that we that we work with here, I think. Um, but I wanted to also point out the difference between tracker and aggregate. Um, so we have aggregate, which is, uh, as I mentioned, it might be the number of doses given in a particular month or a particular quarter uh, at a particular place. Um, or it might be uh, the number of uh, deaths from malaria or something like that. Um, that is more about routine data sets, and it doesn't have any uh, identifying information about who, who, who those deaths were or who those, those vaccines were given to. It's only uh, collecting a number or a, a kind of an aggregate value. Um, Tracker is about uh, capturing the, what, what's known as longitudinal information about individuals. Um, it's not necessarily about Always, always referring to people. Uh, it might also be a um, uh, a batch of vaccines. Could also be a tracked entity instance. But the the concept of tracker is to um, to identify events that happen to a particular thing, whether that's a person or a batch of vaccines or something like that. Over time, it could also be a building. There's lots of different ways to model uh, information in DHS2, um, but this is uh, identifiable and, and uh, associated with that particular thing. In most cases, that's a person, so a patient, for instance, um, and then tracking the uh, um, 
the things that happen to that person over time. So that might be um, for a, um, uh, a pre and postnatal care program that might be um, checkups that are given to a pregnant woman before she gives birth. And then maybe uh, there's a new tract entity instance for the baby that's born and then vaccination events that happen to that baby. Um, they're the, the administered to that baby. And then that uh, is tracked in DHS2 tracker so that you can say, see that this particular person received these treatments or uh, exhibited these symptoms of a disease or those types of things. Um, again, it's completely open-ended. So different DHS2 instances can, can model this in different ways. And that's very important to keep in mind, especially when you're building applications that uh, are intended to be generic and used across different DHS2 instances is that you can't necessarily assume that everyone has modeled their data, their metadata in the same way. So now we'll talk a little bit about the web API. Um, the, the core of DHIS2 is a, a huge uh, Java application with lots going on inside of it. Um, and it exposes uh, a REST API. Um, if you're not familiar with REST API, um, you, can, you can Google it. It's, fair, it's a fairly common term. Um, but it, it basically means that you are sending an HTTP request to a particular URL. Um, and getting a response back, uh, and it should be, um, uh, yeah, it basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's one, one form of designing that API. I won't get into too much of the specifics of what REST API means. Um, to access the API, obviously, you need a session. So in a browser, you can log in to the, the, the URL of your DHS2 instance. Um, you, you, you log in with your credentials, it sets a cookie in your browser, and then you can just browse the API using get requests from your browser, uh, just like normal. So we'll get into how to do that in a minute. Um, if you're not using a browser, you can use an authorization header. Um, this uh, is not recommended for production use cases because it can be quite uh, expensive for the server. Uh, it can also um, potentially expose your username and password if you're not careful about protecting it. Um, but for testing, this is a nice way to um, experiment with the API. So you have to uh, basically encode the string um, with a particular, uh, like basically to base 64 from, uh, from text. Uh, you can Google basic authentication, type in your username and password, though I wouldn't recommend doing that. Uh, and you should be able to, it, it should tell you how to create a base64 encoded string. Uh, and then you put that in a header in your, um, in your DHS2 instance. If you're using something like Postman, the, it will do this for you. You just put your username and password into Postman and it will do the encoding for you already. And um, we'll talk about Postman as a tool in a minute. To navigate through the API, there are a few different ways to, uh, to kind of do that. Um, one of the main ones I would say is actually just going to the documentation. So docs.dhis2.org, I'll show that in a minute. Um, but you can also do some navigation through uh, the API itself. So if you go to slash API slash resources, it will list all of the metadata endpoints that are available in that system. The metadata endpoints might change slightly between different versions of DHIS2, though they're fairly, um, fairly consistent for, for some time. Um, if you go to slash resources, it will list uh, all of the different uh, metadata resources that are available. Um, there's something like 85 of them, um, so there's quite a few. Um, some are used much more than others, so don't worry, don't be overwhelmed by how many there are. Um, It'll also tell you the singular and plural version of that name when it appears in the API. Um, so when you have references to this resource, for instance, program to track entity attribute group, um, that will be referred to as, when it's singular, it will be referred to as a program tracked entity attribute group. And when it's plural, it's a collection of multiple program tracked entity attribute groups. Um, and then this is the most important one. You have an href uh, link here, which will show you where the uh, where to get the list of all of the pro program track entity attribute groups in a particular instance. Um, there, uh, this is a little bit of an older slide, so I don't 
know that this actually is the right um, uh, metadata endpoint to, to demonstrate, but we can show that at a uh, looking from the, for slash API slash resources, it will list out all of the ones that are available in that particular instance. Um, you can then, uh, as I mentioned, go to slash API slash the name of that resource. Um, and that will last uh, list all of the metadata items of a certain type. Um, there are some parameters that are available in that. I'll get into that in a minute. Ah, here are those parameters. Um, so when you're looking at metadata endpoints, so this um, a, a very simple uh, one to think about is um, indicators. So indicators are they basically just a calculation that DHIS2 does to determine some number from a combination of other numbers. So it might be the number of, um, let's see, the number of uh, vaccinations for a particular vaccine uh, that are usually given to people that are, or children that are under five years old, divided by, or not under one year old, divided by the number of births that year. So that gives you kind of what percentage based on the number of people that you know were born and the number of people that were given this vaccine under that is supposed to be given when they're under one year old, um, you know what your coverage is for that value. So that, that's one example of metadata and we'll get into too much of how to model things. Um, but you can get a list of all the indicators in an instance if you go to slash API slash uh, a version number slash indicators. Um, I'm going to go quickly over to a browser here to show this. Um, let's do, go to our Academy instance. Uh, can you, you can still see my, my screen, is that correct? Yeah, I think you can. Yes, yes, we can. Cool. Um, Okay, so we're gonna go, this is our, our instance. I just logged in. So now the, the browser knows, uh, has, has the cookies for my um, uh, session. So it, I can start to navigate the API. We're gonna go to that API slash resources um, endpoint. Uh, by default, this shows um, XML. You can also uh, do question mark format equals JSON, and it will give you the, the same thing in JSON. Um, which is nice. Um, pretty much all of the endpoints uh, accept this format parameter. You can also do .json on some, um, on some endpoints as well. Um, so this is the list of all of the metadata uh, um, endpoints that are available in this DHS2 instance. Um, let's go and find that indicators that I just talked about. Um, there, here we have indicate, oops. So there's also program indicators, which is tracker instead of aggregate, but we'll, uh, we're not going to deal with that today. So we have this indicators link here, which goes to slash API slash indicators. Um, it's also important when you're actually navigating through the API, it's fine to use slash API because that is typically ref, uh, redirected to the most recent version. But I know that this version is on 235, I believe, maybe 236. Uh, and so I can use the, two th the, the 35 API version and that will fix the, the responses to the version that a, a 35 server knows, knows about. Um, and so I can do the same thing with 35 in that um, endpoint as well. It's important to note that if you're using the SDK in Android or if you're using the uh, app runtime in, uh, the, on the web, you don't need to make these API requests directly. Uh, you, the, they do it for you, uh, and you also don't need to. Um, uh, you also don't need to specify the the API version, for instance, because that's automatically determined for you in most cases. Um, so here we have the list of of indicators. You'll see that we have uh, two things going on here. We have paging, so we have something called a pager here. I'm going to turn this into a JSON, so it's a little bit easier to read. So we have pager, um, which has, we're currently on the first page. There are two pages total. Uh, the total number of indicators in this system are 83 and our page size is 50, which means that we'll return 50 items per page. Um, so here we have the first 50 uh, indicators in this, uh, in this system. 
So now if we go back to our um, uh, list of parameters here, uh, we have paging, uh, which defaults to true. Um, you can use paging equals false, but do not do that, please. Um, so this has been uh, something that has caused a lot of problems for us in, in very large instances, particularly with COVID-19, as we're starting to get situations where you have uh, thousands or millions of uh, of items that might be returned if you have paging equals false. So in this case, it returned 83 items, but if this had 10,000 indicators or 10,000 org units, which is very common, or not very common, but but does happen in a number of DHS2 instances, um, this, is, this is really problematic. So you can do paging false, but don't do it. It might be removed in the future. Um, and we actually warn you not to do it in the app runtime as well. Um, but you can change the, the, the size of this paging. So we have, as I mentioned, we have this pager and we also have indicators as the two uh, fields here in this response. In pager, we have, uh, we're on the first page, our page count is two and our page size is 50. But 50 is a lot to display at one time. So maybe we only want to display 10. Let's say page size equals 10. So I can pass this as a, a parameter to the REST API. This is called a query string parameter. And when I do that, now our page size is 10. Um, you'll see that there are only 10 indicators listed here. Um, and we still have the total size, uh, total number of indicators is 83, but now our total page count has gone up because we're only showing 10 per page. This is page one. So this is indicators one through 10. We then have 11 through 20 and then 21 through 30, et cetera, until we get to 83. So there are nine total pages. If we wanted to see what that next page would be, we, we can add the page parameter here as well. So and page equals two. So now our page is two. We're, we're getting the, this is numbers 11 through 20. And page equals three is numbers 21 through 30. So you can actually uh, get go through the list of all of the different indicators, counting 10 at a time and get them back. And the reason that you, you always want to use paging uh, for metadata endpoints particularly um, is that if there's a huge number, number one, it's it will take a very long time to download all of that information, which probably you won't actually be able to display to the user in a meaningful way. And number two, uh, it will, um, uh, it, it could even crash the browser in some cases. If there are so many indicators uh, that need to be downloaded, it might take many megabytes of memory and then the browser becomes unusable and your user gets very frustrated. Uh, and in some cases, it might be very bad even for the server because if you have uh, 10 million tracked entity instances and you're trying to download all of them, which you, luckily the API won't, won't allow you to do, but if you had a, a million of something and the, the server needed to load that into memory before giving it to the browser um, and you had 10 different people using your application, that becomes very, very expensive very quickly. Um, so always use paging. You can specify page size and page to indicate how, how you want to do this pagination. Um, there's a, yeah, so here we, we talk about page size. We talked about page. Um, now let's talk a little bit about fields and filter. Um, so you'll see here that the the default um, fields, I'm gonna get, get rid of this. Uh, I'm just gonna do page size one. So now with page size one, we actually only get one response back. Um, you can actually specify, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do this here. I'm gonna do page size three, just so we can see all of them on the same page. Um, you'll see that each of these has an ID and a display name. So for indicators, the default fields is ID and display name, but I would recommend that you always specify exactly which fields you want. So if you only care about ID and you don't need display name, you can just say ID, and then you only get the ID back from this um, endpoint. Um, so this is the ID of all of those indicators that you're talking about. Probably display name is an, an interesting thing to, to look at. Um, so let's keep that in there. Um, maybe we also want the code. So DHS2, I'm not gonna get into the, how to identify objects in DHS2, but there are three different ways. You can use the ID, the code, um, actually ID and code are the main ones. 
Um, and I, we can get into more, more details about that later, but there's also often a code that is manually specified for a particular indicator. Uh, name, I guess, is the other one. Name is the, is the third one. Um, another important thing to note here is that display name, which is listed here, uh, is you can also use name, but I would not recommend it. So display name will be translated. Name will not be translated. So if you have translations for metadata in your DHIS2 instance and you use the name field, it will always be in whatever the default language is. Whereas if it's you have display name and let's say you have both English and French names and they, this user is uh, a French user, they will see those names in French rather than in English. And users that are uh, English users, um, English speakers will see those names in English instead. Uh, and similarly for, for every other language that you have defined in your system. Um, so here we have ID, display name, and code. We can also do uh, star. So this gives me all of the fields that are available for this particular indicator. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide because I had talk a little bit more about that here. Nope, this one. So you can have, we, we talked about have, having a single field name. So you have a, uh, actually I have one more here. Yeah, so you have the name for instance, or you might have ID code and display name. Um, you can have also complex ones, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, and then you can also have uh, these, which are called um, presets. Um, so star is a preset, colon, some name is a preset. There are a few other um, options there. So star is the same as colon all. And this basically gives you all of the, um, all of the available values, and there are quite a few for this particular instance. I would also recommend, as this slide says, um, do not use these presets. We actually warn you in DHS2 uh, at runtime not to use the star or all presets because it could download way more information than you need and you're not really clear what, what you want to download. So if you specify, you can use this, um, sorry, this is here. You can use this to see what what data is available um, when you're just exploring the API, but when you actually want to do it, uh, want to want to use it in your application, you should always specify exactly which fields you want. So we have, let's say, we have ID, display name, and then remember this was an indicator which has a numerator and a denominator, and it divides those uh, the numerator by the denominator to get some indicator value, which is the percentage of how, how good you're doing or, or what, what, what is going on in this system. Um, so let's get the numerator and the denominator here as well. All right, so then we, we're back down to a reasonable amount of information. Um, remember, even if you're paging uh, and you use the star or the all, um, you get a lot more than you bargain for. So we have these translations here, for instance, that we don't need all of those for um, every, every time we download, because we, if we're using display name, then we have the, um, the full name, uh, or we have the translated name already. Um, we also don't need, uh, for instance, let's say these uh, indicator groups. So if there were a ton of indicator groups associated with this uh, indicator, this would be a very, very long list that unless we're actually working with indicator groups, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. But we can, so if we go back to our uh, one here where we have ID, display name, numerator, and denominator, we have also indicator groups. So if we do indicator groups, we'll see that list come back. This is a little bit dangerous because it can be problematic when these lists are very large. So you can also do paging, which is by default page to 50, but We'll get, we'll get into that separately. Um, so indicator groups, and then you can specify if you use either a, a parenthesis or a bracket, you can specify what you want within this indicator group. So let's get the ID, the display name, and the code for each of these indicator groups. Uh, and it looks like these, these indicator groups don't actually have a code, but you have the ID and display name, which I've specified here. 
Um, as, a, as a warning in the future, they're using a code which doesn't exist on indicator groups uh, will become an error. Uh, the server will, will throw an error in the future. So don't use, try not to use um, fields that don't exist. Uh, if, if they don't. So if you did uh, my field or something that doesn't exist, right now it just comes back with nothing, but in the future that might throw an error. Um, so this is how right here, I'm sorry, this is a little small. I'll go back to the slide. Um, this and this are ways to uh, kind of drill down and expand the, the response. So we're talking about an indicator and we could also say, see the ID of the indicator group that's associated with that indicator and go make another request to indicator groups slash that ID. Uh, but instead we're going to just like uh, specify that we want the name and the ID or whatever else from that indicator group, or in this case user within that response. There are also some operators for doing things like renaming or paging collections within the DHS2 API. Uh, you can find more about that at docs.dh2.org. I'm not gonna not gonna go into too much today. Um, you can also look at schemas. Um, so uh, this is another way to explore. This is uh, defining kind of the the hierarchy of data metadata in a DHS2 system. But I won't get into that too much either. Um, for uh, filters, so we we talked about paging, page size, page fields. Filter also works here for collections. Um, so if you have a collection, you can use a, a bunch of different, um, uh, you can use a bunch of different uh, filters to sp specify exactly what you want to return. So let's go back to our list of indicators here. Um, I'm gonna get rid of most of these and just get the, the default again. So now we have, ANC one, two, one, one to three, one and two. Let's add a filter which says uh, and filter equals um, display name. Now let's go back here and look at some of these operators that are available. There are quite a few, um, but I'm going to use uh, dollar like, which is uh, a K, uh, dollar I like, I guess, which is a case insensitive string testing um, uh, a particular thing. Actually, let's do an equals first. So let's say display name equals this one. So this will return just one. Uh, hopefully, if we do this right. So now we return, we basically are filtering this list. So this is still the, the, the all indicators endpoint. We're filtering it down to only the one that has this exact display name. Now let's change that to uh, display name dollar I like A and C. So this will be, oops. Yeah, there we go. Dollar I like. Uh, a and C. So this gives you all of the indicators that are um, starting with the word A and C. This is really helpful for things like searching. Um, so we have, again, we're paging and we only are uh, allowing three per page. Um, there's a total of 11 that start with uh, A and C. So let's make 20 our page size so we can see them all. These are all of the 11 uh, indicators that start with A and C. Um, so you can do a lot of really powerful things with these um, filters as well. Finally, um, if you have this ID of this particular indicator, we go to, so instead of going to the indicators endpoint, we go to indicators slash this ID, uh, and then you get the, um, just this one, um, uh, just this one indicator response. You can then, you, Filters doesn't make sense here. Paging doesn't make sense here, but you can specify fields and I would recommend that you do. So let's do uh, display name and code again. And then we have the display name and code just for this one particular uh, indicator. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour of the DHS2 metadata API. Uh, we didn't talk about data, uh, which you can also um, access through other endpoints at, at um, uh, in, in the DHS2 API system. Um, you can also do things like posting, deleting, putting, and patching to 
edit information in the metadata systems. Um, there's a lot that you can do with this. We talk, we call them mutations in um, the app runtime uh, language. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, you can explore this with, if you use D2 CLI on your local machine uh, in a, 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 an environment that you can mess around with, uh, you can use Postman or curl to test out different commands and see what happens. Um, that's a whirlwind tour. I'm going to now turn it over to Jose, who will uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, particular API endpoints and um, uh, particularly ones that are of use to uh, Android and Tracker. Um, but they're also useful, I think, or interesting to know about, at least uh, for web application developers as well. Uh, Jose, over to you. Thank you, Austin. Uh... <laughs> Super, super interesting. I think that you have say almost everything about the API. I don't know what I'm <laughs> going to say now. Um, but in any case, let me um, share my screen. Uh, OK, thank you, Martin. Um, OK, I'm going to keep it short. Um, so, but I think this also is interesting in order to know uh, the way that we are using the, 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 the attitude to API in the, in the Android development context. So um, basically, I'm going to share, um, uh, well, Victor already showed this slide yesterday. Uh, but I think it's useful to keep it, to have it in mind uh, that uh, basically all the Android applications, I mean, the, the, the official Android application uh, built by UIO and, and other custom Android applications that are using the SDK, they, they don't interact with the API directly. Okay, so basically, it's the Android SDK who are inter which the tool that is inter in interacting with the with the API. This basically means that uh, the developers that are using the SDK, uh, they don't need to know. I mean, it's always useful, very useful to know, of course, but they don't need to use the API if they don't need to. Okay, so um, that's a. Uh, is it? I would say that this is a, an important thing to understand here uh, that the DHS2 SDK, the Android SDK, encapsulates the, the API complexity. So instead of calling the API endpoints, you need to just use uh, Java methods calls in, in your code. Okay. So, but in any case, it's useful because some people, many people ask, uh, okay, but what are the API calls that are not covered in Android? It's possible to extend the, 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 the SDK uh, behavior in order to add more, uh, more API endpoints. And the answer for all, for all that is yes. Okay, and we are going to see that not in this current workshop, but in the, in the, in the next workshop that is going to take place in, in May. Um, so basically, uh, how in the SDK are we selecting the, the, the API calls? How are we like uh, interacting with the, with the, with the DHS2? So there are like two basic rules. We normally are trying to use the most efficient API calls. And for that, that's the reason because we are always in contact with the backend team guys uh, to be sure that we are using the, exactly the, 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 the most performant API call, like calls. So that means that we, we try to don't stress the server when there are like many concurrent users and so on. Okay. So that's important. And that's a reason because you and the developers they need to use the SDK. And the other reason is like the, the, the good balance, we need to have a good balance between the, the number of API calls. Uh, if we have several users or, or um, you know, so we have we need to be able to reduce the number of, of API calls in order to don't stress the server again. So for that, we can like uh, use, as Austin was explained, explaining the nested operators. So this means that uh, if you are going, for example, to download the programs, uh, the SDK, what it's going to do is like download the programs and uh, all the all the uh, all the objects that are related to the programs. Like for example, the program indicators, the um, um, program program variables, uh, program sections, and so forth. And also the size of the of data returned by the API also is important. If we just uh, that we only uh, are using the, the data from the HS2, the data metadata that we need. And for that, as, as Austin was mentioning, we have the, these two operators, the filters and fields operators. Okay. So uh, right now in the SDK, we have been, been doing this for the for the last, I would say, like two years. So uh, I think that uh, we have everything there that the Android developers need. But in any case, as I said before, it's good to know uh, what, what is the context here, what are the APIs calls that are being supported already, and what can be extended. So 
Um, as I say, as an overview, uh, as uh, also uh, mentioned, in my, mentioned by, by Austin, so we can like, divide the, the, the number of API calls in order to uh, the metadata uh, or data uh, and like other that are more generic uh, endpoints, okay? That gives you information about the systems, uh, about the other particular endpoints that store JSON files and, and so forth. So in the metadata from the SDK, we are only using the get. So that means that we, in Android, we are not allowing to post metadata. Okay, that's not allowed. Only the get for data elements, categories, programs, organization units, and so forth. And the data, of course, yes, we, we, we allow the post, of course, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Uh, and we have like, and we are going to see this in a moment that we have a, um, support, we are supporting like the three the three models of, of the access data values that is aggregated events for single events with no registration and, and, and tracker. Okay. So uh, if we move on, uh, in terms of metadata, uh, so this is more or less uh, to give you a context and idea of, about the, 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 the resources that we are downloading, right? So we started like, uh, for instance, like the downloading information about the user that is trying to 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 uh, to log in in the in the in the, in, in the access to through 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 the Android application. So with this API call, okay, API me. So this gives information about the the user username, what are the user roles, uh, user groups, the authorities for the particular user, what are the 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 other units that the user has access to, for both for searching and for data capture as well. And then we, we download like a, a, so everything that is related to the user. Well, also some system info regarding the, the, the what is the version of the access to. You know that the Victor has explained yesterday that the, that the SDK is compatible with different, with six different the access to versions there. And this is because we are reading the, the, the what is the, uh, the, the, the access to version exactly using this API call. Okay, so this happens automatically at the moment of, that a user logs in, in in Android. Okay, and then from there we are like downloading the org units, category combos, categories, option sets, data elements, also the indicators, everything that Austin was mentioning, data sets, programs, program stages, rules, uh, relationships, and track and bit drives. Okay, more or less. I think that if this is not covering everything that we are downloading uh, from the SDK, it covers the 95%. Okay. And the good news is like you don't need because these calls can be a bit complex because as I said before, uh, this is not only just calling the APIs uh, because also you need in the API, you need to uh, relate it to different objects that are inside of other objects, okay? So this can be a bit complex. So uh, for the Android SDK users, instead of they have like a simple method, so that is D2, metadata module uh, dot download and this will download and synchronize all the metadata automatically for you okay to give you an example and as i said because this can be a bit complex so if i'm going to go for example uh, in mind that the, we need to download the the, the the list of programs that the user has access to so this can be uh, okay i'm going now to um you can still see my screen, right? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, I didn't want it to happen that. Okay, so basically this is a list of programs that, that my user has access to. But of course, with that, uh, we have here the, the, um, the ID, the display name. But of course, this is not uh, what we, we, we need more, more information from the server, like what are the program stages, what are the program indicators, uh, uh, the styles of the program and all that. So, so basically the, the, the call is, uh, can be a bit more complex. And, and basically this is like a kind of a summary of the call because it's quite more complex than, than what I am like copying here. Okay, but to give you an idea, Like with just one single call, we can have like all this information here. It takes a bit of time uh, because of the browser needs to render this. Um, okay, but but basically here we have information about every program, the 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 user that has created the program, uh, program rule variables, the organization unit that this program is linked to, and and so forth. So. 
basically all this, as I said before, is is encapsulated uh, if you uh, for Android developers when using the SDK. Okay, all this complexity. So uh, this is regarding the metadata. Okay, and regarding data, uh, we have just a few endpoints. Uh, we have data value sets. Okay, there are you know that there are different ways that you can like use uh, for downloading or of, uh, posting uh, aggregated values to the system, but we are only using this data value sets for aggregated values. We are using events for single events with no registration. We are using API track identity instances for tracker data. Okay, and then also uh, for uh, this is related to the previous one. When uh, one capability that we have as well is like to search. TIs that are in the in, in the server. So this happens now in the COVAX context when people uh, they have, for example, uh, access to the whole country and there are like a one 20 million TIs because the TIs, every TI is going to be a person of a, in, in a country. So in this case, we of course we can we cannot download all the data. Okay, so uh, because again it's a very small device and the and the size is very limited. Uh, in the database. So we then what we do is search online, do a, a, an online search in order to match what are the track identity instances that the user is looking for with uh, when the user like for example, specify a name or an ID or whatever. So this is the, 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 the API call, the uh, track identity instance slash query for, for doing performing this kind of uh, online search. Okay. The way that it works is just uh, going to give you a couple of examples. Um, is again, is quite simple. So data value sets, uh, forget we have one single call per data set, okay? And in this case, we are passing the uh, four parameters that, that can be the set ID, the period, the org unit, and the children. This means that uh, uh, if we're going to specify not only the, the current org unit, uh, the, the root org unit, but uh, that the user has access to, but also the, the, the ones that are below uh, that particular org unit. Okay, so for example, let's do an, uh, let's do an exercise. So first, you know that uh, I can use let me do this. Okay, for example, this is a data set that, I, that, the, that, we can, uh, that we can use in order to, for example, download the data. Okay, um, so we have the name, uh, this is the um, population, and this is a yearly database. Okay, the, the period type, you have it here, is yearly. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, passing these parameters here. This. Okay, so I am downloading like the information that contains that is containing in that data set uh, for the last, I mean, uh, like for these periods that uh, uh, 2016 till 2021. Okay, so as you see, there are not much information. Okay, but uh, because I don't want to do this, that takes longer than this. But basically, it's the way that we have in order to, to retrieve that is the case doing in order to retrieve the data. Okay, uh, the aggregated data. Um, so then, in terms of calls, it's as simple as uh, uh, for the SDK user, as simple as calling the D2 method, the object here, aggregated module data download. Okay, and we'll do everything for you. Okay. And posting uh, for posting, basically the SDK is like uh, compiling all the all the information of all the data values that are new, regardless the data, regardless the data sets, the periods, or the units, and send all of them in in a single API call. Okay, with this with this method. Okay, and this is for aggregated. The same for for events. Um, you know the, the events the, for events. The way that we we have in order to uh, to the load events. In Android, is using the events endpoint, uh, in, and we only have to specify the units, uh, the program, and then the, the the unit mode. In this case, it's a sentence. The sentence means that I'm going to the load events 
for the from the root or unit, this or unit, but not only for this or unit, but also for all the descendants, all the units that are descendants that are in the lower level in the hierarchy below this this particular unit over here. Okay. So I am copying this, for example, you so you will see how this looks like in the in the uh, API. Okay, and this is the information that is being downloaded in, in, in Android. Okay. And well, basically I think that we, we are also not downloading in, in, in as XML, but we are downloading in as JSON. It's a matter of adding here JSON here and it will like change the representation. Um, in any case, again, we can use SDK and this can be automatically done uh, for SDK. And for post, it sends all the events in a single API call, regardless the program that they belong to, regardless the, 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 the um, their units, okay? And last, let me go through the most complicated one that is the uh, track identity instances. And for track identity instances, it's a bit more complicated uh, because here, this is like uh, the schema. Uh, I think that most of you are very familiar with this, uh, uh, with the uh, concept of tracker and also Austin mentioned it a bit for five minutes in his presentation. But here we have like, a, you know, we have a track, we have different levels. We have the track identity instance level that can enroll in different programs, can be a, in a malaria program, in an HIV program, okay? And then there are the, uh, for every enrollment, there, is a, there are events as well, okay? So this is more complicated then in order to then retrieve the data from the, from the, uh, from the, um, uh, uh, from the server and also, this endpoint can be a bit dangerous if you are downloading many, many track identity things at the same time. Okay, so we need to be very careful when we are like retrieving data that are tracker data. Okay, so again, the API endpoint that we are using is, is API track identity instances, and it's one single call per unit. Again, regardless of the program here for, for, for tracker, uh, we download all the TIs that the user has access to. Okay. Well, there is a limit that we, we can we are going to see that in the in the in the in the uh, in the Android track. Okay, there, there is a, a limit of the number of maximum of TIs that you can download. Uh, but basically, it's that this is important that we are downloading uh, TIs regardless of the program that they belong to. Okay, and it's specifying Android settings in other way, but uh, I don't want to uh, go very complicated with that one. Okay, so basically, this is a call. Well, this is a call that is not going to work, but I'm going to show you what is going to render here. Okay, because in this case, basically what the API is giving me is like all the track editing instances that are uh, that be, that are below that are, which enrollment is below this part, this or unit over here that is Sierra Leone in our server. Okay. Um, but it only gives us information about the, the attributes, okay? Names, uh, first name, uh, okay, last name, uh, all that, okay? Um, but again, we need more information because we also need enrollments and, and the events. And this is a bit different from the web because in Android, we are trying to get everything at once, okay? We are trying to reduce the number of API calls uh, that we can do with the, against the server, okay? So then what we are doing, and this is, uh, sorry about this, but uh, we have this very incredible long API call, okay? But here, what is interesting is like the nested fields because if one single API call, track identity instances, we are also uh, getting the attributes, okay? The enrollments, the events. I, I am not adding the relationships because I wanted to keep it very simple, well, as much simple as I can, because this can create a lot of complexity in the API call. And then the notes, okay? So now if I uncopy all this very long piece of API, and uh, here, then I can see that uh, I can see the enrollments with the attributes, I can see the, the sorry, the enrollments with the events. So in this case, I can see this particular TI has two, two events. Okay, with, with these values. Okay, and of course, if you have to do this by hand, it's going to be, I mean, quite complicated. Uh, it took us a while to get with to this uh, API endpoint. 
So that's the reason because with SDK, we, we are encapsulating all this complexity for you. Okay, so you don't need to really know how this, I mean, it's very useful to know how it works, but uh, you have to know that we are uh, hiding this complexity. And so basically this is what we have. And well, for posts, uh, the way that it works is what we are like posting uh, 10 TIs per call, uh, because again, we are, we need to be careful about posting many TIs at the same time that we can, uh, the server can have performance issues as well. And TIs that are across all the programs and audiences that the user has access to. Okay, the documentation is here um, with this, within these links. Um, yeah, basically this is what we have in, in the CK. As you see, we are not using other endpoints like are more related to analytics. Um, I mean, I mean, maybe there are others that uh, we can add in the future. Okay, but at least it's, it's, I think it's useful to know what are the contexts that we are that we are having in the in the that we're using in, in the SDK. Okay, and I think that's all for me.